Hi, everyone. Hi, Sam. Wow, that was, that was bad. That was really bad. All right, let's try that again. Hi, everyone. Hi. Sweet, that was so much better the second time. Um, thank you all for coming out. I know the weather was crappy earlier, but I'm excited that everybody's here. Um, today, I want to talk about Intro to Go. Um, so this is me. That's me on Twitter. You should follow me. That's a gopher over top of my head. Um, if you don't actually want to pay attention to what I'm saying, every slide has a gopher on it. So try to find the gopher. Just saying. Every single slide. Um, a little bit about me. Um, I work for a company called HashiCorp. Uh, Four-fifths of our tools are written in Go. Um, I've been doing Go since about September of this year, um, so I'm definitely not an expert, um, but I've written a couple um, pretty largely used tools at this point. So I had to like print out this joke because Justin did it on Twitter. Apparently, my last name is also has a Go in it, so I felt the need to emphasize that. Um, there's no relation, I promise. So like I said, I work for HashiCorp. Um, if you don't know what HashiCorp is, uh, you may recognize like Vagrant Packer, Surf, Console, Terraform. Um, these four are actually written entirely in Go. Uh, maybe a little bit of Bash mixed in there. Um, but what most people don't know is there's actually a little bit of Go in Vagrant. Um, some of the binaries in Vagrant's actual launcher, like the Vagrant thing that you type, is actually written in Go. Um, so all five of our products have some resemblance of Go. So, uh, what I wanted to talk about first was do like a history. So a little bit about how this is structured is we're going to go through like kind of non-technical things. Why go? How does it compare to other things? And then I'm actually going to go through some examples. Um, I want to be absolutely clear that you're not going to come out of here with a degree in Go. One, because that doesn't exist. And two, because I only have like a half an hour. Um, but please, if you have any questions, write them down. Feel free to ask me afterwards, etc. So. Um, it all started in like 07 um, when Rob Pike, um, Rob Thompson, and some other dude who I can't remember right now. Rob, uh, Grace. Yes, and I wrote it down. It's in the slide notes. Um, <clears throat> uh, but Rob Pike is kind of the like the face of Go, at least now. Um, so in 07, they kind of got together um, and they said the existing state of languages uh, pose some problems. Um, We'll talk about those in a second. So the modern languages, you had like your C's and your Java's, uh, Ruby and Python, Node.js was starting to make an approach, Scala was this like hybrid Java thing, um, JavaScript was coming out uh, as like a first class language, web apps were becoming the future, and Apple had kind of started talking about Objective-C and then later on um, in like what, 2011, Swift came out. So in 2008, um, you know, they identified these problems and had like a whiteboard sketch of what the language would solve. So the problems with the modern languages of the time were uh, you had to choose between efficient compilation, efficient execution, and ease of development. So if you look at something like Ruby and Python, very, very quick to get a prototype out, um, very, very low barrier to entry for developers and engineers, but not the most performant in production, not the most stable in production, and um, definitely not the cheapest to run in production. Compare that with something like C or Java, which has like an incredibly high barrier to entry. I mean, usually you go to college to learn C or you spend months learning it. Um, it takes a really long time to compile. Like you have to somehow deploy it. But once it's deployed, um, because it has type safety and a whole bunch of other things, like the chances that it crashes in production are much lower. It's a much more reliable and safer tool. Um, and the problem was you really couldn't pick all three of those, it was really difficult to find a tool that even had two. It was mostly one. Um, do you want your developers to move quickly and your operators to have a really bad day? Or do you want your developers to move very slowly and your operators to have a very safe day? Um, type safety was something that's on the rise, like Python and Ruby, like zero cares to what type it is. You can assign X to a string and then the next line assign it to an integer. Um, compare that with like C and Java, which are super, super strict. You have to declare your type going into the variable declaration. And Scala was kind of this weird hybrid approach where you could like declare the variable, but then it was like set as that type forever um, until you undefined it. So those were the problems with like modern technologies. At the same time, um, technology in and of itself was kind of rapidly evolving. Um, no longer did we have monolithic giant applications. We were moving into this era of microservices where we have these small kind of idempotent applications that uh, basically act like inodes on a graph. They take input and they produce output. So 
uh, we're moving towards a modern era where kind of none of these tools really fit what the uh, you know the original authors of Go saw as the trend in technology. So they came up with these list of requirements. Um, the first is that it has to compile incredibly fast, um, and it has to execute incredibly fast. So your code can be incredibly fast, but it takes two days for your application to compile. You can't ship and deliver in any reasonable amount of time. Uh, it has to be highly concurrent. Again, we work in a microservices model. Uh, concurrency, we look at like modern computing. We're operating on multiple cores. We need to take advantage of all of those cores. Um, <clears throat> Built-in garbage collection, because ain't nobody got time to write like free. Um, support for dependencies, because they recognized that community was uh, one of the things that made Ruby and Python much stronger than C and Java, was the ability to just grab this community tool and bring it in and use it uh, without really having to understand the entire system. Um, and it had to be good enough for Google. Um, it had to be good enough that this was something that Google could run in production on their systems safely and sanely. So, 2009 is like the first official birthday of Go. Um, there are reports that it had been used internally before that, um, but that's when like the official release happened. Um, it was open sourced, it was made public, and people started using it. Um, and now we're in 2015 and a whole lot of stuff has happened, um, both in computing and in the Go programming language since then. So that was like the brief history. Um, now we're gonna talk about Go as a language, what it has and what it doesn't have. So Go has this incredibly, incredibly solid core. Um, there's some puns coming up in these pictures, just to warn you guys. Um, <clears throat> uh, <laughs> Go kind of has this mantra of like batteries included. Um, you see that on the, the Golang documentation, like all of the Go textbooks, et cetera, they use this batteries included. Built-in JSON serialization, built-in web server, kind of built-in everything. Um, the primitive support is really great, and then there's also abstractions on top of those primitives that are built into the core language. They're well tested, they're highly performant, and they're well documented. Uh, Go has a very robust community. Get it, nerds? <laughs> You're laughing at me. Um, it's okay. So Go has an incredibly robust community. Um, we'll see in a little bit the way that you import a dependency is you just specify the URL for it. So pretty much any Go library that's on GitHub, you can just import uh, as a dependency. There's also lots of forums, the uh, GoLang mailing list, the GoNuts mailing list, et cetera. It's all public. It's all like vibrant with people who are excited, uh, and they love using the language. Uh, it has incredible performance. Um, it's not quite as fast as C, but it's like a bajillion and five times faster than Ruby and a bajillion and four times faster than Python. Um, it's, and, it, and it has incredible performance for authors as well. So it doesn't just run quickly on the actual hardware. It runs, it writes itself quickly from the engineering perspective. Um, it has built-in linting and formatting, um, which is a big one for me who has OCD. Um, I don't have to argue with people. So this is actually a console template, which is one of the libraries I've written. On the left um, is like, if you just write kind of crappy Go code and you don't worry about your indentation or your white space, um, as soon as you run Go format, it'll like automatically indent things, it'll automatically add white space where appropriate, it'll line things up in your structs, so everything's vertically aligned. Um, if you have any semblance of OCD, Go will make you very, very happy. Um, there is no gray area, there's one style and you follow that style. Um, the advantage is that Go will apply that style as best it can, so um, you never really have to argue and you're not wasting time like tweaking things. Um, the, the uh, formatter will do it for you. Uh, it's very easy to build cross-platform binaries with a few exceptions, um, as long as you're not like binding to like very, very low-level system calls, which is something that's possible. Um, you can basically cross-compile to any platform, including Windows. Um, and this was one of the major selling points uh, combined with like speed and uh, speed to write and speed to run of why the majority of our tools are written in Go. Uh, if you've ever tried to deploy cross-platform Ruby, it's very, very difficult, especially for the Windows story. Um, Go makes it actually incredibly painless. Um, there's a, a bunch of tools out there. Some of, uh, we write a tool called Gox, which is a Go cross compiler. There's like GoXC, um, but basically it's one command and you get spit out an exe file, you get spit out like an actual binary file for various operating systems. And it's super, super fast and super easy. Um, <clears throat> Go has built-in GC. Um, for people who come from like a C land, that's kind of scary. Um, they really like their malloc and they're free. Um, 
But from people coming from like a Ruby and a Python background, they, they love the fact that they don't have to think about memory management. They don't care whether their structure is going to go on the heap or the stack. Um, it, it doesn't actually matter. Uh, in modern computing, we have so many resources available that those types of low-level optimizations are generally not worth the trade-off of actually having to think about it. And Go is incredibly great at optimizing um, those types of decisions for you. So Go does not have a pretty website. Um, I personally find their documentation very difficult to follow, not because it's well, like, not well documented, but because the layout is like one ginormous HTML page and you have to scroll or like click through a links to try to find anything. Um, I think the documentation is great. Um, I think the way it's laid out is not the greatest. Um, there's no support for generics, um, and I'm not going to go into the reasons why or why not, um, but Unlike Java, you can't just like have like this generic interface that you can apply to things, um, which means if you're trying to make a set, for example, that takes some type of object, it's very, very difficult because you have to generate a unique type of struct for each, uh, each set container that you want. Um, and finally, Go has really terrible SEO. Um, if you try to Google Go, yeah, uh, which is ironic because it was created by the search engine that doesn't show it in the results until like the third thingy down here. Um, pro tip, if you are working on Go, uh, Go Lang, all one word, is what you want to search for. Um, it makes it much easier to find things. Um, but those are kind of the three drawbacks that I find with Go is without fail, every time I try to find something, I Google like, you know, uh, Go Big Int, and it, I get like some video game back. I'm like, Go Lang, Big Int. Oh, there's the documentation. Cool. Uh, so very briefly, how do you install Go? It's this incredibly super painful process. You download the binary and put it on your system. Um, if you want to compile from source, those instructions are available. Um, I think as of Go 1.4, like Go's compiler is written, or Go is compiled with Go's compiler. Um, so it's super meta. Um, so like Go compiles itself. Uh, <clears throat> the next thing you do after you install it is there's these two magical environment variables. One is Go path, one is Go root. Um, and this is kind of like your working directory. So if you've ever worked on like Ruby or Python, this might be kind of foreign is because you just have projects wherever they are and whatever your working directory is is your working directory. But with the way that Go manages dependencies, it has a very, very strict file hierarchy. And it wants to know, this is where I'm going to do my Go work. And a lot of people, that's just like home slash source slash Go. Some people, that's like some NFS share. It doesn't really matter. What matters is that all of your Go development happens within this Go path. The advantage to being an environment variable is that it makes it really easy to write Go version managers, because all you have to do is change that environment variable, and all of a sudden, you have a new version of Go. You're pointing to a different set of dependencies, et cetera. Um, and then the command line tool, uh, unsurprisingly, is Go. Um, so you run Go. This is the help output. You can see some of the things in here, are like build, clean, format is that linting function that we talked about earlier, um, list. Uh, and then there's some in here, like vet. Um, and you can also run Go tool. So if there's like third-party tools that you've installed that do particular things, you can execute them with the tool command. And um, I guess now we're going to jump into code because that's what this slide says. Um, so the very first thing is this is Go. Uh, it's kind of hard to see, but I have like file names down here. So this says example.go. Uh, the very first thing to see is there's package declarations. So everything in Go has to belong to a package. Um, kind of like in Java, like main is the main package. Um, so this is like the top level. Um, the main function can only live in the main row. Well, the main function is only executed from the main package. Um, dependencies are imported with this import statement. Things that are from the standard lib are imported using just their name. Things that are third-party dependencies are imported using their URL path. So for example, if I was to import a third-party library from GitHub, I would say import github.com slash bill slash go library. Um, and that would automatically be pulled in when I run go get, which is the dependency manager that's built into go. Uh, comments are uh, just two forward slashes. Function definitions are done with the func keyword, F-U-N-C. Um, even if you have no arguments, you're required to have parentheses, uh, which is something that you know, Ruby allows you to be optional. Um, you need Egyptian style curly braces. It's like strictly enforced. When you run go format, all of your curly braces become Egyptian style. Um, and uh, it's, it's dot oriented. I never really figured out what the actual word was, but um, you have, it's read from you know, left to right. It encapsulates from inside out. So, Cool. Uh, oh, and then 
when I were to, if I were to run this, so if I were to like actually save this as example.go, I would build it by running go build. Um, and I think that took like 0 0.0000 seconds on the system. Um, and then you invoke it as a binary. So you just run example. Um, and you can see that the output here is hello world. So this very basic function declares a main package, inputs the formatting package, has a comment solely for demonstration purposes, and then has the main function, which just prints out some strings. Uh, the main function, like this main function, is special. When it lives in the main package, that's what gets executed when the binary runs. Um, cool. Uh, and as you can see, Go is like incredibly fast. The whole execution of that binary, including load time, took like seven one thousandths of a second. Um, it used 54% CPU, um, so pretty fast. So here's a more complex example. Um, and I'm going to run through it, so don't immediately jump back. Um, I find that people learn best through examples, at least I do, so everything here is kind of example driven. Um, so the first thing is like totally ignore all of those import statements. We'll talk about those in a little bit. The first thing here uh, is this buff IO new reader taking in os.standard in. So what this is doing is this is essentially asking for user input. There's a couple different ways that you can ask for user input. Um, this is using a buffered IO reader, and it's reading from standard in. So os.standard in is like what you type on the command line. There's also os.standard out, which is standard out, and standard error. Um, <clears throat> we're essentially reading until the new line character. So basically, read text until the user presses enter or carriage return. Um, if I was writing something like truly cross-platform, I'd probably check for like slash r there as well for Windows carriage returns. Um, <clears throat> and then finally, there's like this whole magical function, which I'll explain in a bit. But at the end of the day, the result of this text, so whatever the user typed in, is going to be printed um, back out. So I want to like decompose this together. So um, the text comes in. And then we call this like trim space function on it. The reason we call trim space is that the read string is going to include the new line character. Um, and we don't really want to include the carriage return back in the output. Um, then we're going to put it into a print function. So if you've used like Python or C, printf um, and sprintf are like pretty standard. Um, this is how you do interpolation in Go. So you don't have like Ruby's pound curly brace within a string. Um, everything's done with sprintf or like other f functions. And finally, we're outputting that to the terminal in this case. So to give you like a real example, if we took away all of the extra garbage that was in here, and we got rid of the reader, and we just set this to a static string. So this is essentially simulating the user typing in hi and hitting enter. What we would have is the text would come in just like that. We would call trim space on it, which is going to get rid of the new line, new line character. Now we're going to sprint f, so we're effectively interpolating high into q. Uh, percent q is a special uh, function in Go that basically it prints out the best representation of the object, which for strings is a string quoted string. Um, so you end up with this. So you have my name is high, and those are escaped. So things are escaped with a backslash. And uh, it compiles to this, and then sprint f uh, forward. And then ultimately, that prints out like your name is high. So backtracing, as we apply these functions, you get the final result. Um, and this error checking is something you'll see a lot in, in Go. There are no exceptions in Go. Um, errors are first class objects. They're a thing. You can query them. You can write methods on them. You can define your own error types. Um, Go has this notion of a panic, which is like something really bad happened. Um, it's not quite the same as a seg fault, but you can think of it as like a seg fault. Um, it's where like a control that should have not happened happens. So if you try to like access an index out of range, you're going to get a panic. So uh, if I were to compile and run this, and I typed in hi, you would get your name is hi with the quotes, um, just as we saw when we broke it down. Um, and I'll have all these examples on GitHub afterwards. So if you want to like kind of follow along, try it out, um, you're definitely more than welcome to. So going back to this example, um, I kind of glanced over this magical import. Um, so there's a whole bunch of stuff going on in here. We're importing buff.io, uh, format, OS, and strings. Uh, and how do we, like, what is that doing? How does that at all relate to what's going on in this main function? Well, the name of the package is what 
gets imported in the first call. So unlike your traditional object-oriented program, uh, programming languages, in this case, buff.io is not some instance. You're not calling a method on an instance. You're actually invoking a public method on the buff.io package called new reader. Uh, similarly for strings, strings is a package, and we're invoking the public trim space function. Uh, and you can see OS is used here, and FMT is used a couple places for you know, printing the original output and then printing the final output, as well as any errors that occur. If I were to add an additional import, for example, this is um, IOUtil, which is a handy library for like reading files. Uh, and I were to try to compile this, Go's compiler is very, very strict. Um, and it's gonna, yell, oops, it's gonna yell at me and say, hey, you imported this package that wasn't used. Um, and it does that for two reasons. First, uh, it likes to be annoying. And second, uh, it's because you don't want to have all of these extra imports and generating these like 10 gigabyte binary files that you ship around when you're only using two megabytes worth of dependencies. So Go's compiler is incredibly strict. One thing that I really wish was in development, if there's a flag you could pass to Go that was like ignore the strict compiler, and then like finally when you're ready to build, turn on the strict compiler, but it's not there. Um, so sometimes it's a little bit painful for developing where you go to run go build and it's like you're not using this package anymore. You have to go and like delete that line and then compile it again. But ultimately it's, it's like good for the end result of the program uh, and it's definitely a trade-off. <sighs> So I wanted to look at an example, uh, and obviously like the number one example in programming is hello world, we did that already. The number two example is fizzbuzz. So um, this is fizzbuzz in a language that is not Go. This is fizzbuzz in Ruby. Um, and if you're not familiar, if you are familiar with Ruby, this looks super simple and familiar. If you're not, basically we're going from one to max, max is a parameter to this function. Uh, if it's divisible by five and three, print fizz buzz. If it's divisible by three, print fizz, five buzz, otherwise print i. Is anyone not familiar with the fizz buzz problem? Fizz is um, like a very common interview question that is uh, basically, it's this. Uh, given a list of numbers from one to n, if the number is divisible by three and five, print fizz buzz. If it's divisible by three, print fizz. If it's divisible by five, print buzz. Otherwise, just print the number. So for example, you would have what, one, two, uh, fizz, five, four, buzz, six, and then like 15 would print fizz buzz because uh, it's divisible by five and three. So the same result here in Go looks pretty much identical. Um, so if you, if you take away like the fact that this is def and this is func, um, and the fact that this is an up to versus a for loop, they're pretty much identical. Um, the, the modulo check is identical. We're using and and for booleans. We're printing using FMT. Um, and I've obviously left out the import statements here for in the package declaration for simplicity. But you can see that it's very, very similar to what you might see in like Ruby or Python. So side by side, um, they actually map line for line. They have the exact same number of lines. Um, and this is a, a super simple example. I just kind of wanted to compare something that people are generally familiar with, um, how you would do it in Go and how you would do it in Ruby. Cool. <clears throat> um, here's like another variation. Uh, so in this example, we're using else and like elif statements. Uh, you can also use like in Ruby, it's called next, which means stop termination and go to the next iteration. In Go, that's called continue. Um, so this basically short circuits the loop. So if this conditional is met, we don't ever go down here. It's like another way to write an else statement basically. Uh, and it starts back up to the next integer. Cool. Um, so now I want to look at like a little bit more complex of an example. Um, how many people are familiar with like the Fibonacci sequence? Right, so it's just taking two numbers, adding them together. That's the next number in the sequence. So <clears throat> here's how you would recursively implement Fibonacci in Ruby. Um, super simple, uh, if the number is less than two, uh, so one and zero, just return one and zero. Otherwise, return n minus one plus n minus two recursively calculating those values. Um, this is the exact same thing in Go. It should come as no surprise. Um, it's, I mean, it's literally the exact same thing. Um, <clears throat> if you replace curly braces with n's and funks with defs, it's the same. Um, I guess the biggest difference is you have to declare your return type as well as your um, input type. So the fun part here is 
Um, coming up next are benchmarks. So which one is faster? How many people think Go is faster? Okay, how many people think Ruby is faster? Cool, so Go took 1.027 seconds um, to generate the 40th Fibonacci number. Um, so how many instruction sequences is that on the stack? Cool, trivia question. I'll let you guys figure that out. And I have stickers for, oh, that should have been my trivia question. <laughs> Next time. Uh, Ruby took 17 seconds, almost 18, 17 and a half. Um, you can see that they're both at 99% CPU utilization uh, on average, but <laughs> Ruby was at 99% CPU utilization for 17 seconds, Go is at there for one second. Um, you can also see what's interesting is the actual like boot time of Go is 0.01 seconds spent in the system as opposed to Ruby which sent like 0.04 seconds in the system. Um, so Ruby itself actually takes a long time to launch. These numbers are strikingly different in, in Windows. Like this is like 0.2 seconds in Windows and like a full like 0.8 seconds in uh, Windows with Ruby because spawning Ruby processes in Windows is unbelievably slow. Um, but we can make this super efficient um, if we just choose a different algorithm. So it turns out that recursion in general is really, really like not performant. Um, you have to shove a whole bunch of stuff onto the stack um, and there's like all of these instruction sequences and then you just unwrap the whole thing only to return one result. Um, so Go can efficiently uh, reassign variables on the fly. So this is an incredibly fancy way of generating a Fibonacci number, which sets i and j to 0 and 1, respectively. So you can do multiple assignment just like that, as long as the number of variables on the left matches the number of variables on the right. And then um, this is a simple for loop that's basically iterating like max times and swapping i and j, setting i equal to i plus j and j equal to i. And it does that all in one instruction sequence. So it's super, super fast. So there's uh, only 40, three, seek 45 instruction sequences that happen. So FIB of 40 with this algorithm takes 0.004 seconds. So it's super, super fast. Um, this same algorithm in Ruby, which is also possible, takes I think 1.2 seconds. Um, I don't think I made a slide for it, um, didn't. But it's, it's noticeably faster, but also noticeably slower. So how long do you think it would take to count the 1,000th Fibonacci number, keeping in mind that you need to also calculate the 999th, 998th, all the way down to the 0th Fibonacci number. Yeah. Because we haven't changed the same number of instruction sequences. It's exactly the same. Um, we're just iterating more times. And the compiler is super, super good at optimizing these instructions. So uh, if you're curious, <laughs> that's the 1,000th Fibonacci number. Um, I'll tell you how I cheated in a little bit. Don't worry. What if, uh, what if we didn't want to actually like return the number? What if we wanted to return some type of generator? Um, in Java, it'd be like an iterator. Um, in Clojure, I think it's called a Clojure. Um, that basically, I can just keep asking for the next Fibonacci number, pretty much indefinitely. I just want the next one. So I have this like kind of skeleton function called fib generator. It's going to return something. Uh, so let's kind of build this out together. So we're going to have some closure-y thing. Um, I had to use the word closure because, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and it has to do that operation that we did before. So it has to do that like i and j being initialized to 0 and 1, and then like swapping j and i. Um, so this is the same thing that was in before, but I've put it in the loop declaration. So we're assigning i to j. 0 and 1, there's no invariant, and then i and j are equal to i plus j and i. So that actually happens in the for loop, gets evaluated during each iteration. And we need to like do something with i, because during each iteration, i is the next Fibonacci number in the sequence. Um, so we can wrap this in a closure-y thing. Um, Go has support for anonymous functions. So the same way we declare like func fib generator, we can declare an anonymous function. It has no name. Um, and this is a full closure. Uh, and we can run that in the background using what's called a Go routine. So if you shove Go in front of any function, it immediately backgrounds. Um, and it runs in a Go routine, which is not a thread. It is not a background process. It is a um, highly optimized and very difficult to explain uh, construct. It's safe to think about them as threads, but they don't operate the same as threads. So we have this Go routine. So when someone calls fib generator, 
we're basically firing off this background job that is still managed by the parent go process that generates these numbers. So now we need like this thing that returns the magical generator. Um, and what could that possibly be? We need to somehow send the data from this go function that runs in the background. We basically want to pipe this data back up to the parent process. So C exists outside of the closure, and the closure has access to C. And we want to be able to send data back up to C from this background process so that we don't block the main thread so other execution can occur. And this other stuff is happening in the background, but we need a way to still communicate between those two processes. And finally, we want to return whatever that magical thing is. Um, and that magical thing is, like, what could it possibly be? I'll give you a hint. It starts with a C, because I use that variable name. Um, and those are channels. So channels in Go are something that's incredibly unique to Go. And it's a way to essentially pipe information and share state across multiple Go routines. So what does that look like? Um, just like an int or you know, a, a struct, um, you have channels. The keyword is C-H-A-N. And channels have types. So everything in Go has a type. So I'm creating a channel of integers, which means the only thing that's going to come over this channel are integers. I could send objects over channels. Um, I could send entire functions over channels. So you could have a channel that returns functions, etc. Now, this is a read and write channel. And we'll see how you read and write from a channel a little bit. But I'm actually just going to return a read-only channel, because I don't want the parent who j grabs this fib generator, I don't want them to be able to write numbers to my channel. They should only be able to read numbers from my channel. Um, and this is, this is the way that we write to the channel. So it's this like less than dash thing. Um, and these read from right to left, unlike the rest of Go. So we are pushing i onto the channel. Um, which basically is sending data from this subprocess up to the parent process. And then we're returning that channel. So how might that look? In a main function, for example, we would create a new fib generator. So this here is actually returning a channel, right? Because the result from function is, or from fib generator is a channel of integers that's read only. And then 25 times we're printing the result of fib. How do we get a value off of a channel, well, it's just the opposite uh, direction, or not the opposite direction, it's just the opposite side of the less than dash thingy. Um, so the arrow always points to the left. There is no such thing as a right pointing arrow in Go. Whether it's on the left side of the function or the right side of the function determines whether it's a read or a write. So if it's on the left, it's a read. If it's on the right, it's a push. So this is actually a very simple way of generating 25 Fibonacci numbers without blocking the main routine. So if other work was happening in the main routine, this Go function is running in the background, generating numbers. Uh, but does anybody see a problem with this approach? There's like one very big problem. Yeah? If the channel breaks in whatever way, like, and you're still depending on it, or you're trying to read off of it, that, I mean, that could be So if you try to read from a closed channel, you're going to panic. That's true. But you have to close a the channel. They don't just auto-close. OK. No, the problem here is you're going to leak your Go routine if the reader returns. OK. There's also there's another really big one. That's true, but that wasn't what I was going for. So this, uh, yeah, blah. So um, this particular block, for example, uh, is going to run indefinitely and consume lots and lots of CPU resources by pushing on to this unbuffered channel. It will. I promise, I was at 100% CPU usage. Um, but we'll talk about that after. And I will, I will use this to prove a point. Um, so this is basically an indefinite loop. And it's going to run and try to push onto this channel forever. Um, Go has this notion of buffer channels, which is Effectively, you can tell Go to only hold so many items in the channel and then to block the push on the channel until there's a free space. So you can kind of think of it as like an array. And I have, um, for example, 50 elements in this array. And don't push a new item onto the array until there's space for me to be able to push on. Um, and in this case, if there's 50 items in the channel's buffer right now and this Go function attempts to write, it will block while trying to write 51 onto that channel. Thus, we don't have this like infinite loop going on in the background. 
Uh, so this is how you create a buffer channel. Um, it's just a number, it's an int. I think it's a uint. Um, and it can basically be any size, um, or you can just go for like the unbuffered component. It really depends on uh, what you're looking for. Uh, like I said, that's gonna block. So uh, moving on to talk about structs, but we're gonna keep with the same example. Um, so a struct is kind of like a class. It's not a class, but it's kind of like a class. Um, it's like a C struct um, in that you can define types and you can define properties as well as functions on a struct. So this is where Go is like kind of a little bit object oriented, um, but Go is not an object oriented language. It doesn't have inheritance, um, et cetera. Uh, one thing that's super interesting and a little bit confusing if you're just reading Go code um, is how do you declare public versus private functions? It's not like immediately intuitive, um, and that's because it's all with capitalization. Um, so capital uh, variables and uh, structs and functions are public, and lowercase ones are private. So if I create a function with a capital P called public func, it becomes publicly available within the package. It's package public. Um, if I create a function with a lowercase p, like private func, it's package public, or it's like locally public, but package private. So you cannot access private func outside of this package, but it's fully accessible within that package. So other classes or other, other Go files, et cetera, can still access that function. But as soon as you try to import that as a dependency, private func is no longer available. And the same goes for fields on structs as well as the structs themselves. So we're gonna keep the struct private just for the purposes of this demonstration. Um, in general, you have like some type of an initializer uh, when you have a private struct like this. So I created an initializer called newfib. It takes uh, an integer, which is the size of the buffer, and it returns like a pointer to, uh, that should be a lowercase f, a pointer to the fib struct and an error. Um, there's actually no error to return here, but in general, things return both like their pointer and any errors that occur. So just kind of following the Go standard here. Um, we make a new fib struct. Uh, so we allocate a new fib struct. We set its buffer equal to b make a channel, um, so this is the same thing we saw earlier, and then spawn off this Go routine in the background, pushing onto that channel, and then uh, returning, instead of returning the channel this time, we're returning the actual um, Fibonacci struct, or the fib struct in this case, and then nil for no error. Um, so nil is like the equivalent of null, um, or nil in other languages. Um, and the way we would use this from like a main function in the same package is we would create a new fib, check if there's an error, um, and then basically read from that channel. The problem is reading from that channel because it's private isn't accessible to other people outside of this package. So maybe that's okay, but let's just hypothetically assume we're building a, uh, you know, the Fibonacci generator that is gonna be used by other people. So what we really need is we need some type of function that return, a public function that returns the next number in the sequence. So Next is that function. It starts with a capital N so that it'll be public in the package. Um, and we can basically return a read from that channel. So we're effectively abstracting the read from the channel into a function, and that function returns an integer as opposed to before where we were just directly reading from the channel. Um, and instead of this, which is what we had before, we now just call f.next, which will read the next value from the channel. Um, and I added a sleep in here just for like the purposes of running this. And you can see that um, you kind of get the same result. But as we go along, um, you start to get some really creepy results. And this is where I said that I cheated earlier um, is because uh, goes max int. I don't remember off the top of my head, but the max uint is like eight times 10 to the ninth, I think. And then it just starts wrapping back over. Um, so you get kind of weird, crazy, negative numbers as uh, integer arithmetic becomes very difficult. Um, so what I did in my actual example that generated that really big number was I used a package called, oh, this is my favorite meme ever. Um, uh, yeah, it's that number, whatever that number is. Um, that's the maximum uint64, and we wrapped that, so we went back around. Uh, I used a package called bigint, which is built into Go core. Um, which allows you to deal with like incredibly large numbers efficiently. 
Um, so my, my routine, which I can share on GitHub, is slightly different than the code that I put up here, but I wanted to provide something that was simple and not bog you down. Um, so that's what I meant earlier when I said I cheated. Um, so if you want to learn more, um, and I haven't like totally killed your love of Go at this point, um, you can go to tor.going.org. Um, I will say that the tour of Go is, I think, 80 chapters now, um, and it takes you from like the very basic, this is how you print something, and the final is building a web crawler. Um, and you very quickly go from this is how you print something to this is how you build a web crawler. Um, and it's a little bit frustrating at first because you're given like, you're given like, here's two paragraphs of text about how functions work. And then you're given this like incredibly hard problem that you don't actually see how it relates to those two paragraphs of text. Um, but at the end of the day, it's actually super helpful because you get to like think like a Go programmer. Um, which is something that I'd never done before, so it was super helpful. I was just frustrated at first. So if you are doing the tour of Golang and you find yourself getting frustrated, just like take a step back or like actually ask on like the Go mailing list or in like IRC um, or you know ping someone who you know is good at Go and say, hey, how did you solve this? Um, the answers are available. People post them on gists and stuff, but I would discourage you from doing that until you have your own solution and then you can compare. Um, one thing about Go, just like Ruby and Python, there's usually like probably 10 to 15 different ways to do the same thing. Sometimes it's more performant, sometimes it's just a style thing. Um, so kind of finding out what works for you is definitely varies um, with the type of pro problem you're solving as well as you as an individual. Um, so this is me. Um, again, you can follow me on Twitter. Um, thank you for listening to me talk slash rant. Um, as we talked about this morning, I am never rant about anything. Um, and I wanted to end with this amazing video that is going to play with sound now. Um, yes. Maybe. Yes.